I was really uh, blown away the first came the first time I came across the story of Sea of Thieves, where I think you innovated some of these practices in in games development. So, so what triggered your interest in finding different ways of working in games? Well, um, I started out my career in games as a gameplay programmer, you know, so implementing gameplay features um, and worked on a few titles um, and had expected to keep doing that. But for uh, for roundabout reasons, I found myself in, in an SDET, uh, you know, software engineer and test role uh, at, at Rare, uh, the studio that develops the Thieves. Um, and uh, I ended up really appreciating having the opportunity to kind of help an audience that I really care about, which is developers. Um, and also once I started in that role, you know, I kind of came into it as like, well, I know nothing about this, so I better start reading. Um, <clears throat> came across, you know, TDD, um, all other kind of, you know, testing related topics and just found that there was kind of a fascinating world there that I had just been completely blind to. Um, and also realized that I had, as a gameplay programmer, been throwing my stuff over the wall to a, a huge manual test team with really no conception of like, did it really truly work? Um, so it really was a revelation to me um, that those quality practices existed that could help me uh, be a better programmer um, and be less wasteful, you know, catch things further upstream. Yeah, I, I, the, the idea of throwing the change over the wall and not thinking about it, I, I think that's, 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 that's maybe not obvious to people that haven't worked this way before, but that's actually one of the big wins because it feels like throwing things over the wall and letting somebody else worry about it is the win, but actually it's the other way around because we're optimising to increase our own feedback and confidence in the work that we're doing, and, and that seems like a liberating change to me. Right, and especially in a complex system <clears throat> like a game, when you make a mistake at a low level and you're then trying to find it at a very high level, there's like many layers of complexity that has to travel through to show yeah. up there. And then you have to go through a whole like reproducing step if you can reproduce it and then debug it. And it's just so much simpler if, you know, like if I'm writing serialization code, you know, if yeah. I can just write that TDD and just know that it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, that ability to kind of, you know, focus your attention on the right places to look when something's going wrong, I think is is one of those huge benefits to, yeah. to to adopting this way of working. So so what do you see as the particular challenges for adopting continuous delivery and automated testing in games? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And there's like the facetious answer, which is that like, well, there aren't really any that don't exist in other domains to a greater or lesser degree. But I do think that there is um, a genuine case for games being, you know, especially tricky for yeah. a number of reasons <clears throat> and you know and we can kind of dive into a number like th th i have a list of notes there are a number of them um but i think like fundamentally i would kind of boil it down to you don't really know what you're making up front is a, is kind of maybe may a difference again not so much of a difference like there are in many other domains you know uh, we tend to imagine that you know people are just like well i know what business software to write it's like well no if that was the case then there wouldn't be agile practices that exist to, yeah. to mitigate that um but yeah all of those problems that are found in the other domains we tend to just have like many of them <laughs> so mm -hmm. that kind of conspires to consume the attention and resources of the team in such a way that it seems then like a luxury to try and invest in um, these kind of practices like into slavery. And I think um, there, there's also such a wide range of uh, types of games that are made all the way from, you know, one or two people working on an indie title up to, you know, thousands of people spread across the globe working on a thing, right? And so, of course, you're going to need to adjust the um, the intensity and, and discipline of how you develop software based on those, those constraints. And so, if you are in that one or two people, I still think there's benefit to be had. <clears throat> and I've seen actually a couple of examples. Um, Andrew Frey did a talk about um, the testing on Roller Drum, which is kind of a smaller title, and really did a great job, I think, explaining how even on that small scale, you can mm -hmm. get massive benefits from having kind of a very targeted safety net. Um, so yeah, yeah. broadly, he had just kind of um, put in place 
kind of high level validation that certain core things worked that could be then you know run across all of the say characters that are in the game rather yeah. than doing a lot of very custom test writing so for like a few hours of test writing they got a ton of value uh, and then also targeting their most complicated system, which was their character movement. So it's a game where yeah. kind of you're on roller skates and you go up and down ramps and things and spin around mm -hmm. and shoot. Um, <clears throat> and by doing that, he said they were basically able to move from having sort of a two week code lockdown before milestones to being able to like they made a very fundamental change to the physics system right before release. Yeah, 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 and and that that kind of. Feedback, feedback on the fundamentals. I, I, I suppose so. So it's not you. You, you certainly want to apply these kinds of techniques as broadly as you can in the scope of your problem. But I don't know. I'm making an assumption here. But certainly, my limited experience of using TDD for writing simple uh, single-player games, which I've done for fun and and rather as an intellectual exercise rather than anything else. Um, but but doing that it seems to me that the separation that i've i've been making is between the the functioning of the code and the gameplay the gameplay i'm reasonably happy to be interactive and playing it to see what the feedback is i'm not going to write uh an automated test to say you know is this fun to play uh, that's a different kind of more subjective more human kind of evaluation it seems to me and I, I think that people often get hung up with that kind of stuff when thinking about this but if we can do away with the the, the drudgery of just saying have I broken anything while I was trying to play you know make this more right. more effective and keeping the gameplay fun <laughs> Would, would you yeah, agree I, with that kind of separation? Yeah, definitely. And I think like if you haven't worked in that environment where you have a safety net of tests like that, yeah. it's really hard to imagine what it would be like to just be able yeah. to kind of safely make changes. You know, like it's very common in games, you know, you'll find like those, you know, several thousand line functions that no one dares touch because it yeah. works right now, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think um, there's, I guess, another kind of challenge in games specifically, and I imagine in other in other domains too, is that yeah. relationship between like development and QA. Um, historically, and to a greater or lesser degree, there is a large stigma around you know being in in QA. Um, yeah. it, not the same everywhere, of course, but there are definitely companies that really treat their their QA people as sort of you know less than. Um, yeah. So that then stigma kind of affects the um, yes these people have a lot of great knowledge and, and, and information yeah. about what what needs to get tested that could be really helpful to programmers who want to write tests uh, so yeah. where i've seen it work really well is where that that kind of silo can, can be bridged and those folks can work together um and you know like things like three amigos from the bd yes. um yeah yeah 100 percent. My, my 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 own preference in in sort of team organization certainly in larger more complicated projects is to have professional test people not to do all of the testing or to write all of the tests or to own all of the testing or to own the responsibility for quality really but to bring that different perspective of thinking about how we evaluate and how we you know, grow the quality of our systems more effectively as part of the development team working very closely very collaboratively with with, with developers I think that developers should be owning responsibility for the testing themselves because it seems to me that it works best when it's a fundal, fundamental part of the development process, which I know you've spoken spoken about and written about a little. Yeah, and you know, you 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 were talking about um, you know not writing tests for is this fun, and that's absolutely right. You know, that's the last yeah. thing you're trying to write a test for, right? <clears throat> the, I think the the anti-pattern that we see a lot with games is that we leverage humans as computers. Um, yes. And, and I remember um, at Rare, we talked a lot about that um, that line in one of uh, Jess Humble's talks where he, he says like, you know, uh, when when you have humans do stuff computers could do, then yeah. all the computers get together at night and laugh at us. Um, yes. Which just, it would just seem so apt, <clears throat> but but still it, it's very prevalent. And there's, there's a few kind of structural reasons and historical reasons. Often folks who are on the QA side maybe don't come from a technical background, so it can be harder to kind of bridge that gap. And then, yes. you know, uh, 
adds to that whole kind of lack of understanding and empathy. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley, a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>